Hello, everyone, and welcome back to GRASP Student Faculty and Industry Talk Series. Uh, this week, we're happy to have Kelsey Allen with us from MIT. She's a PhD student in the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department, where she is advised by Professor Josh Tenenbaum. Before MIT, she obtained her bachelor's in physics at the University of British Columbia, where she contributed to publications on particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider and uh, Collective Intelligence in Ant Colonies. Now as a member of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, her graduate research has received awards, including an NSERC PGS doctoral fellowship and a best paper award at RSS 2018. And today she'll be discussing her research on the interactions between predictive representations and planning, particularly for tool use. So I'll hand it over to Kelsey and we can get started. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you very much for inviting me to come talk to you today. It's really an honor to do so. And I just wanted to let people know that I'm finishing my PhD in about a month and will then join uh, DeepMind as a research scientist. So that's coming up soon. So today I'm gonna to tell you about my work on reverse engineering core aspects of human intelligence and how we're incorporating some of these insights to make more general purpose and flexible AI. Um, and today I decided to give you a little sampling of a bunch of different projects since the GRASP lab is obviously so diverse and I wanted to try to include something for everyone. So to jump right in, a large chunk of my PhD has focused on what I think is a particularly impressive facet of human intelligence, which is tool use and tool creation. Humans are some of the most advanced tool using and tool creating species in the world. And tools are really all around us. And as this particular example shows, sometimes even inside us. Uh, for example, this artificial heart was made by some of humanity's most sophisticated tool creators after many years or sometimes decades of experience. But even if we're not all as skilled as that medical engineer who made that heart, tool use and tool creation is still universal across human history with all known cultures having developed physical tools for hunting, crafting, and various cultural rituals. And tool use and tool creation are seen even in our youngest children who clearly learn how to use tools effectively through a very rich and sometimes painful, painful trial and error learning process, which I wanted to show you now. So in this particular example, this child has a new very important problem of trying to get an Easter egg from atop a power box. And he immediately has this spark of innovation that he can grab this nearby shovel and immediately try to use it in a variety of different ways to try to get that egg. He tries both ends of the shovel, switching when he doesn't think that the shovel end is going to work. But unfortunately, uh, he can't fine tune too much before just a slightly more height endowed child comes and takes the egg away. And so now in order to get the egg, he might need a new tool, perhaps a shinier, more distracting one in order to get that egg from her now. And similarly, while tool use is quintessentially human, other intelligent species such as crows can craft and creatively repurpose objects in their environment to solve physical puzzles, unlike any they would have encountered in the wild. So I just wanna show you again, one more fun example of this crow trying to get a piece of food from a tube of water. And she immediately picks up a block and drops it into the tube of water, understanding that that block is going to raise the water level. When she realizes she's, she can't yet get that piece of food, she picks up another one. And then she even tries to pick up another one. She realizes that particular block is too light, it won't raise the water level, so she picks the block of the right heaviness to drop it in and is eventually successful. In fact, tool use is such an interesting and complex process that it's often used as a cross-species intelligence test to help us understand just how intelligent other kinds of species other than humans are. So by comparison, while current machine intelligence has made significant progress in recent years, it still lacks this flexibility, sample efficiency, and the even creativity demonstrated by humans and animals in tool use activities like the ones I just showed you. So while we now have sophisticated methods for hierarchical planning, which have allowed us to endow robots with the ability to use tools, the resulting plans from these kinds of models are often inflexible and require almost perfect physical knowledge. On the other end of this extreme, while we can now learn uh, a variety of different kinds of loco locomotor behaviors from very little prior knowledge, that often takes on the order of thousands of years of experience. And after this, even after this amount of time, the locomotive behaviors are still not as robust to new obstacles as we might like. To try to get more at this robustness and adaptivity to tasks, a whole host of meta-learning methods have been developed since 
2017 that improve our ability to generalize in a sample efficient manner to new, te new ta test tasks like obstacles, but the extent of this generalization is still pretty limited. Uh, for example, these two, two reaching tasks where a two joint arm has to reach a point in the plane, the point is simply moved between meta train and meta test to different parts of the arena. And moving further outside of that training distribution often results in much less impressive transfer abilities. Multitask learning has made great strides in achieving human level performance across a wide variety of distinct video games, but you know, again, often millions of frames of experience are required and generalization outside of those specific training games is still not particularly good. And on the perceptual or predictive side of things, data sets like Clever have spurred the development of better compositional and neurosymbolic models for combinatorial generalization, but in a more human-like way. But these methods still struggle to discover new compositions like those in this, what I think is this nice clever humans data set where humans develop their own questions for the domain, even if the models that we've built have 17,000 samples that they can use for fine tuning. So like much of the research here in the GRASP lab, my research is aimed at trying to take the best of human intelligence by thinking about ways that we can add structure back into learning representations. And by structure, I mean these kinds of factorized distributions that have been critical to the revolution vision, where things like convolutions as a factorization led to enormous progress in machine abilities to transform, recognize, and classify visual input. But there are many other ways in which the world is factored, which we know from cognitive science and neuroscience. For example, we believe the world is composed of objects and even the youngest children understand what these are. We know that these objects obey the laws of physics, which governs how they move through space and time, and that both children and adults can use these physical models to make inferences about the world in which they live. And we know from both behavioral and neuroscientific evidence that intelligent animals group their observations into events such that their experience is not simply an unbroken continuous stream. So my research aims to incorporate these kinds of factorizations into artificially intelligent agents to make them more like the kinds of natural intelligence we know. So in the first part of the talk, I'll discuss how to harness objects, physics, and events to improve agents' abilities to act. The majority of the talk will focus on our work in creative and rapid tool use in humans and how to replicate similar abilities in machines by harnessing object and physical knowledge. I'll also talk about two other projects briefly, one which imbues significantly more task-specific knowledge to a robot to allow it to perform tool use tasks involving long sequences of manipulations and dynamic interactions, and one in which I will show how far you can generalize by only incorporating object and relational structure into an agent's policy without the need for specific physical knowledge. I'll then very briefly talk about a first step that we've made in trying to discover discrete structure for classification, plus some ongoing and future work that I'm very excited about to discover compositional structure for modeling physical dynamics and trying to learn event-based structure for more efficient acting. So in studying human and biological intelligence, cognitive scientists spend a pretty good deal of time thinking about what kinds of tasks are both ecologically motivated and will elicit, elicit sufficiently interesting and complex behavior to analyze. So for this first project, we want to look at a task which would require object-oriented representations and reasoning. So we chose a task motivated by, motivated by an activity adults and children do often, which is to construct things. So the ceiling on construction expertise is pretty high. Expert human adults can create entire cities that can withstand even substantial natural disasters. But the simplest forms of construction also appear in very young children playing with blocks and even birds who regularly construct impressively stable nests from collections of found natural objects. But of course, like many, many things, machines are still pretty far from successfully doing any of these tasks at the level of complexity of natural intelligence. So we introduce this gluing task, which is still a kind of construction. It requires stabilizing a given tower of blocks by applying glue to them. So here, people get to see a tower of between two to 10 blocks, and they must click circles along that tower to apply glue to that contact point with the goal of stabilizing the tower. Every glue that they use is going to be a point lost with every block that remains standing a point gained. So the question then becomes, how should a given block tower be represented? One option would be to represent the tower in an unstructured way. 
as either a set of features or as an actual image and pass this to a multi-layer perceptron or a convolutional neural network. But if we want to make agents that can actually generalize in meaningful ways to learn how to glue across many different situations, we could also attempt to view the tower as a graph with the vertices representing blocks and edges representing possible block interactions. And another option would be to consider a sparse graph where edges only exist between blocks in contact and represent the presence or absence of glue. Again, a graph representation might be preferable here as it has the ability to explicitly represent relationships between blocks and it can handle block towers of any size as a, as a result. We might be able to intelligently share representations and policies across blocks and edges for much better sample efficiency than we would get otherwise. So now the question is, how can we learn a representation on top of that graph from experience to actually perform the gluing task? So to do that, we'll turn to graph networks, which are a general class of networks that have been applied for a variety of graph-based machine learning problems, everything from predicting quantum properties of organic molecules, predicting traffic flow through cities, or even predicting the motions of objects in different physical scenes. I think many of you here will probably already know how graph networks operate, but for those who are unfamiliar, I'll give a very brief overview of how graph networks work using this following notation. We'll consider graphs consisting of vertices V, edges E, and global properties U, where vertices, edges, and globals can have associated feature attributes. In the general case, edges can be directed going from a sender node VSK to a receiver node VRK. A graph network is then a transformation of an input graph into an output graph with updated attributes for these edges, vertices, and globals. The most general graph network definition includes learnable functions phi v, phi e, and phi u that transform the vertices, edges, and globals respectively, as well as a set of pooling functions rho, which could be just simple uh, functions like the sum, max, or mean of a set. And a choice of networks and these aggregation functions will instantiate a specific model from the larger family of graph networks. So the main question now for graph networks is how to make those learnable functions actually depend on the graph structure. And to do so, the edge function will depend not just on the edge attributes, but also on the values of the nodes which it connects and the global attribute of the graph. So this embedded E prime could then represent something like the forces between blocks in the tower. The vertex network similarly needs to take into account graph structure. And so to do so, phi V will depend on V, a pooled representation of all the incoming edges to V and the global graph attribute. And this embedded vector could then represent something like an updated state for the block vertex due to forces from other blocks in the tower. And just like the other networks, the global network will depend again on the current attribute, as well as the pooled edges from the entire graph and the pooled vertices from the entire graph. This embedded global could then be used to do something like learn to represent the stability of the tower or even the energy of the system. So what I just showed you how to, was how to do a single update in a graph network that can be applied to all the edges, vertices, and global properties of the graph. But you can also run this function multiple times to spread information throughout the graph. So for example, if you consider just v1 here in this particular graph, after one step of updates, it depends implicitly on v2 through their shared edge. But after two steps of updates, it depends on v3 and v4 as well through this updated representation v2 prime. So in this way, we can talk about different hops of the graph, ne graph network or different numbers of message passing steps in order to spread information between all the different vertices. So now that we have that representation, how can we use it? Um, let's first here consider the problem of predicting the stability of the tower, which is going to be a global graph attribute. We'll look at fully connected tower graphs and a sparsely connected tower graph to try to understand whether the added sparsity actually matters for prediction. So we find that in the limit here, sparsity doesn't matter. Both the sparse graph and the full graph achieve equal final performance for the problem of predicting tower stability. But the sparse graph does reach optimal performance faster with fewer samples than the fully connected graph, which underscores a general intuition that many of us probably have that adding structure will improve sample efficiency. So that's nice and reassuring. We can also set up a supervised problem of trying to predict the points of optimal glue along the edges of a tower. 
For each tower, there's an optimal gluing. Here, I'm showing that on the left, which sets up an edgewise prediction problem of for each edge, should I glue it or not glue it? And in this experiment, we tested whether multiple message passing steps would be required to optimally pr predict glue. And we find that at least two steps of message passing are needed, but no more than that. We can understand that result by considering the glue point between the orange and yellow blocks here. These appear locally stable, so would not require glue unless I had information from the rest of the blocks in the tower that does suggest that there's a center of mass that's much, much greater here to the right, and so this is going to topple unless these two things are glued together. So a graph is a relational representation, and I just showed you and convinced you hopefully that we can do prediction with it, but you can also set it up into a relational reinforcement learning problem. So if your representation is a graph, you can define a relational policy by decoding from the edges of the graph, much like in that supervised problem. But now we're going to be decoding Q values instead of just decoding um, a supervised value of glue or not glue. Similarly, by decoding the global graph attribute, you can determine when to stop gluing and end the episode. With this relational policy definition, you can then straightforwardly optimize the graph representation using Q learning with experience replay, and it should be able to do things like generalize to more blocks than it saw during training because it's learning a combinatorial representation of the tower. So let's now check that out. Um, we'll compare our deep relational reinforcement learning agents with humans for this gluing task. And I just want to note that the RL agents here were trained on about 100,000 towers of each size and tested on 15 held out towers for each size. So we can first look at the total reward achieved by each agent with the dashed line representing the total possible reward across all test problems. If we first look at the human performance, we can see they're getting about half of the total reward, which isn't super amazing, but it's also a sort of difficult, unusual task for humans, and they only had training of one tower of each size instead of 100,000. So we'll give them a little bit of a break. By comparison, a greedy simulation-based agent, which has a true model of the world, achieves nearly perfect performance, also somewhat unsurprising. But now the real question is how well the unstructured just MLP, the fully connected graph network, and the sparsely connected graph network perform. So the unstructured method performs very poorly. It performs much worse than humans, despite much more experience. But the fully connected graph network, by comparison, does a lot better. And the sparsely connected graph network does even better still, nearly reaching the simulation-based agent's performance without any model of the, model of the world required. We can additionally now look at the performance as a function of the number of blocks, where the MLP is clearly failing almost entirely after five blocks. But by comparison, the graph networks seem to do very well, reflecting their ability to handle these combinatorial tasks, which is very encouraging um, and reassuring. And we can additionally now look at the generalization by only training on block towers of um, two to six blocks or eight to nine, and then look at how it performs for seven block towers and 10 block towers. So while the sparse graph network both successfully interpolates a policy for the seven block case and extrapolates for the 10 block case, the fully connected graph network is only able to interpolate but does not extrapolate to the 10 block successfully. So this is just another point to underscore the importance of thinking about how much structure we want to add to our models with the more structure we can add, the better we expect the generalization to be. And I really think that this work is very exciting. It came as part of a wave of work on trying to learn dynamics and policies with graph structure. And I wanna just quickly highlight some of the recent work using graph networks and planning and control, such as learning to control complex bodies by joint modeling from the University of Toronto, which I think is very cool. Uh, learning sophisticated forward models for model predictive control from Facebook, as well as follow up work from DeepMind in this gluing domain, using the same relational policies that we developed here, but decoding continuous attributes, such as offsets, instead of just binary glue indicators, which allows them to do more complex tasks involving all kinds of different construction domains. And also some work that I recently very very excitingly came across from the grasp lab actually using graph convolutional networks for even things like swarm control, which I thought was very cool. 
And of course, there's a lot that I missed here, but I think the explosion of work in this area really highlights how powerful these kinds of models are for control, but also reinforcement learning and planning across a wide range of different kinds of problems. So in that gluing task, I just showed you that with sufficient experience and the correct relational structure, a physical model is not required to learn a really successful policy. But these models required lots of examples of towers to learn. And the natural question is, how can we learn faster? And I'm going to suggest we can use physical models. So as an additional motivation for the role of physics, I want to show you another fun video of this crow learning to snowboard with a tiny little metal kind of bottle cap thing that it was able to find. And it, even to imagine doing this, the crow needed some sense of intuitive physics, at the very least, that maybe gravity and slippery surfaces is going to lead to a good time. Um, but just to check though, it does try sliding on the part of the roof without snow and that doesn't work, so it does switch back. In this next part of the talk, I'll discuss our work to investigate this kind of creative problem solving or fun seeking behavior more systematically in both humans and machines. And to do this, we'll need a new set of problems with more variable goals and objects than the gluing task I just showed you. So now we'll, we'll finally turn to the general problem of tool use. So tool use has long been of great interest to the cognitive science community. Um, it's thought to be one of the defining characteristics of human intelligence, but studying tool use has been difficult because it's traditionally required in-person experiments where people have to come in and physically manipulate objects, and then you have to have a whole team to actually code in what ways they're kind of manipulating those from videos. So to get around this, we took inspiration from this popular phone game, which is called Brain It On, and it asks people to draw tools on a screen to try to accomplish different goals. So here's just two examples of that. For example, being able to make a catapult just from drawing things on the screen. So we built a variation of Brain It On that requires selecting one of three objects and placing it in a scene instead of needing to draw them. We consider the setting in which you only get to choose one object, but the constraints of what you have available makes the problem potentially more difficult. Once you've placed the object, physics is turned on and you can see the results of your actions. So this restricted action space allows us to analyze human behavior much more clearly than something like Brain It On, since we don't have to deal with analyzing shape similarity in people's drawings or other kinds of things that we believe could be confounding variables. Concurrently, and also inspired by Brain It On, a team at Facebook built the Physical Reasoning Environment, or FIRE, which was a similar game explicitly designed for comparing and testing the physical reasoning capabilities of deep reinforcement learning agents. So I just want to make a very brief plug for this uh, collaboration that we have going with them. We've just released this environment that attempts to integrate the two, our virtual tools game and FIRE, which we call Ogre for object-based generalization and reasoning environment. So please check that out if you're interested. I'd love to point you to the relevant GitHub repository. So in designing this virtual tools game, we had five central considerations. We wanted something where the goals would be visually defined instead of requiring text like in Brain It On. We also wanted a game where physical reasoning was necessary to succeed in a sample efficient manner unlike a lot of other environments that are currently available in the machine learning world. We wanted a larger range of object interactions beyond others like the gluing task I just mentioned. And we wanted a game in which there could be many different problems, but with one shared dynamics and action space, such that agents could generalize between levels by learning the dynamics or learning action priors. And finally, of course, because we're cognitive scientists, we want to make sure that the task was actually a good example of human tool use in that it elicits few shot trial and error learning in humans. Why are these tasks challenging? They might seem very simple, um, but they're challenging for a variety of reasons. So first, several of the levels involve intervening on some dynamical system rather than assuming everything is quasi static, which introduces a host of different kinds of problems. The action space for this particular game is also hybrid, which is unusual. It has a continuous position, but it also has a discrete choice of tool, and the rewards for the game are relatively sparse. Most importantly, if you wanted to use model-based methods for this game, you would have to have a very good model that could make accurate, very long horizon predictions through complex shapes and contacts in order for it to be useful. And finally, there's really a central question here of what can even be transferred between tasks. 
So we think that meta-learning in this richer problem space will likely yield different insights about flexibility than previous environments. To give you a sense of the richness of that problem space, these are 20 levels from the game. They're designed to cover a very wide variety of different physical concepts, objects, and strategy types. So some levels require creative thinking about how to move something you can't hit directly, such as this catapulting level, or others like this one called Powers B, where you need to get this red block onto the floor, but it can't be hit directly. Other levels require doing things like creating a support, like this table A level, where you have to support a falling plank by putting a table leg beneath it so that the ball can roll across the top. As a further test of generalization, we designed a set of match level pairs that have minimal differences between the scenes, which still have a large impact on which tools and strategies will be successful. So for example, let me just point out shafts A and shafts B. Here, the only difference between these levels is that one of the goal objects that you could potentially get into the goal is now blocked by a very small blocker. This obviously changes the dynamic significantly because now you can no longer hit that ball directly into the goal and need to switch over to the different shaft, but it's something that we expected might be particularly difficult for image-based machine agents since that change is exceptionally small relative to the rest of the scene. Let me just show you some, I think, fun examples of how people actually play this game because I think they're very motivating. So on the left, this participant is trying to solve this tabling level. And the first thing that they do is just try to hit the ball directly. And even though that fails, they do a really classic thing that people do, which is to unfortunately try exactly the same thing again. People are not always you know, super intelligent when they try to do things. But after a couple failures here, they do finally realize they need to put something beneath the platform to support it. And then they figure out that they have to fine tune that strategy a little bit for it to work. On the right, we're gonna watch someone play one of the hardest levels in the game, where the task again is very simple. You just have to get that red ball into the green goal. But the question is how? because that red ball is being blocked by a platform and it's hard to hit directly. So this does hit the ball, but unfortunately very painfully rolls exceptionally slowly and is not rolling fast enough in order to get into the goal. So this participant very dutifully tries a variety of other kinds of approaches to still attempt to get the ball into the goal by hitting it directly before they sort of try something unusual, which is to use the peculiar shape of this hook to drop it from high up so that it will rotate around the platform, imparting enough momentum to the ball in order for it to go into the goal. I point out these particular examples of trial and error learning because I think they demonstrate some very deep things about human cognition that are relevant to think about when designing machine learning agents. So pretty clearly people are demonstrating these sort of aha moments of insight where they finally figure out the right qualitative kind of thing to do and then end up fine tuning it. But not all of their attempts are good, right? They have many sort of semi-random structured initial attempts that are still object oriented. They still affect the scene in some way. And clearly people here are using trial and error to figure out ways of updating their actions that will lead them closer to success. So inspired by these observations, we propose a relatively simple model to try to capture this behavior based on task general structure we think is important for creative tool use in humans. So specifically, we'll call this model sample simulate update or SUP in that it's going to sample structured critically object oriented initial actions to interact with the scene. It'll check those samples by using a noisy physics engine and it will update its beliefs about good actions to take based on both those noisy simulations as well as failures it makes in the real world. So an important point of this model is that we're presuming that people, A, have structured initial actions that they're considering. They don't consider flat actions to begin with. B, they're running those actions through a physical simulator to imagine what will happen before they act. And C, they're using that information to then change what happens in the future but they're not using that information directly to make their world models better. They instead here need to learn how to use those world models effectively for one particular level or one particular problem. And so this is certainly a simple model, but it allows us to point out what we think is an important message for the cognitive science and machine learning communities, which is that models matter and they can be helpful 
as long as you're thinking about these more interesting multitask settings where the model is needed in order to be successful. So now we can look at how the model compares to humans on the game. Humans and the model both take similar numbers of attempts across most of the levels within the game, as well as achieving similar levels of accuracy. So we think that this is presenting a good account of what people do. But those are still pretty coarse measures, so we can zoom in a little bit to see whether the model solves levels at the same rate that people do. And to look at that, we can plot the cumulative solution rate, or the number of participants who solve the level in x attempts for each level. And across most levels here, the human line, which is shown in black, and the model line, which is shown in red, seem to be pretty well matched, suggesting that this model is solving levels at a similar rate to people. And we can zoom in even more on just a couple of levels and look at the precise placements used by people and this model. We'll look at three examples where this human rate and model rate agree, and one where they do not, to point out some of the failings. So visualized here are the first and last placements for both humans and the model. Each colored point represents an individual participant, with the color representing the tool they chose and the position being where they put that tool. The model's choices are shown as those blobby background colors. So we were really excited to see these results because the model appears to be capturing the same kind of initial multimodal distribution that humans show across most levels and does converge to a similar set of solutions to people. To get a sense of that, you can take a look at the first attempts in Catapult in the upper left. Both people and the model seem to try two kinds of actions initially, either hitting the ball directly with the triangle or catapulting the ball into the goal with one of the three available tools. But by the last placement, both people and the model have converged to the correct solution, which is to catapult the ball with the large block. On the other hand, if we take a look at falling A, this was the case where the model rate and the human rate disagreed. This is a super fascinating failure case to us because people are surprisingly bad. They're actually much worse than the model would predict. This level is really easy to solve if you put any object underneath the container to tip it over, but people were very biased to put something above the container and therefore took much longer to find a solution. So we think that this suggests that people are using more interesting contextual priors that might come from real world experience with containers uh, than what we have included so far. So another very reasonable question to ask yourself when doing this kind of cognitive modeling is, do we actually need all these components to explain human behavior? So we can test simpler models by removing each of the components of our full model, either the object oriented prior, the simulator, or the update mechanism. And we additionally test two alternative models, one in which we use the observations that we get from the environment to update our estimates of physical parameters, and then one that uses a deep Q network to attempt to learn generalizable priors from lots of related experience. The DQN was trained until convergence on a set of background level templates. For these level templates, we randomly vary several aspects of each scene, as well as the available tools to produce over a thousand examples example levels of each kind of template. So it gets a significant amount of experience. But if we look at how well each of these models correlates with human accuracy across the different levels within the game, we can see that in all cases, the alternatives are much worse than the full model. And most interestingly, that image-based DQN performs worse than literally everything else, all of the structured object-oriented approaches, suggesting that at least in our current setup, the DQN has not learned a generalizable policy. So in summary for this section, we suggest that structured model-based strategy learning underlies rapid trial and error learning in human tool use, which is a big step for the cognitive science community in moving to more complex tasks than they have traditionally studied. More importantly, on the machine learning side, we contribute an environment for few shot trial and error learning with human benchmarks, as well as a structured model that explains human behavior and incorporates these different components. This obvious, obviously leaves open a wide variety of questions for AI and machine learning, i.e. how to learn these different components, which I think is a very fascinating future direction. But even our initial model of human learning in these games is clearly limited. So for example, an object-oriented prior is not always applicable. There are other kinds of priors that people might be using in order to try to bias their sampling 
in order to plan more efficiently, like these suspicious coincidences where there's clearly a block-shaped hole and a block-shaped tool, and people immediately have the sense that this should go within the hole, but this is an incredibly precise placement, and so our model would not be able to find it. Humans are also sometimes smarter about switching between strategies, like in this catapult example, where our model might get stuck at a local minima of trying to hit this ball directly into the goal, instead of realizing it needs to switch into catapulting this ball so it hits this other ball, and that eventually goes into the goal. And even more problematically, forward rollouts in general, i.e. sampling and action and checking it using a dynamics model, may still be insufficient when many actions need to be taken in order to be successful. So instead, we, not meet, we might need to be smarter about how to plan. So if we consider the tool use cases shown on the right, at their most complex, these involve using one tool to actually get another tool to then eventually get a ball. And this is in the animal cognition literature called meta tool use, which is something that is seen in almost no species other than humans. Sampling actions is clearly not going to work here. So what can we do instead? So in this next project, I'll talk about um, some work we collaborated on with Marc Toussaint to determine what would be required to make robotic agents able to perform the same kinds of tool use tasks that natural intelligences do. So we developed a method that falls under the umbrella of task and motion planning, which is a hybrid multi-level approach to planning that breaks the planning problem into two steps. So in the first step, Task planning, a task tree is constructed consisting of the high level actions, also sometimes called modes that can be taken from any state. And each of these modes is a symbol like grasp, but it is a symbol that takes typed objects as input and it is additionally parameterized by continuous variables such as the angle of force of the grasp. It is therefore often referred to as a hybrid representation or a mixture of discrete and continuous variables. So here's an example task tree for the problem on the right. In the first step, you could try to grasp the hook or the ball. Given that you grasp the hook or the ball, you could try to push the ball with the hook, hit the ball with the hook, or pass the hook back to your other hand. This then leads to more options and so forth until you reach the goal. Finding a plan then amounts to choosing a branch through this top level tree and optimizing for a path that satisfies differentiable constraints implied by those high level actions along that branch. If the cost of the resulting path is low, then the set of high level actions is deemed feasible and can be executed. And otherwise you have to try a different sequence of high level actions. So doing this results in a diverse set of paths that will allow a robot to achieve its goal, such as shown here on the right. And it's very interesting to me that this is able to find multiple kinds of solutions to achieve the goal. It does not have to find a single solution. So it's multimodal in its policy or action space, which I think is really critical. So here's a fun video where by adding a few more high level actions and constraints that they imply, you can solve a pretty wide variety of different tool use problems that would be impossible to solve without this high level action structure. But amazing, there are some key limitations. And I think one of those is coming up. Yes, that one, a very nice tap, but even a better one here. So this is a clear physical limitation where the ball is moved onto a piece of paper and the piece of paper is magically rotated with the ball stuck to it, almost like Velcro, which the robot is then able to pick up. That is clearly completely physically unrealistic and would never actually work if you were to execute it and shows a real lack of this kind of planning behavior without this control adaptivity or robustness. So to reemphasize that point, task and motion planning can accomplish things that many other methods can't, and since it's not doing any learning, in some sense, it's maximally sample efficient, but this comes at the cost of adaptivity and robustness. And obviously adaptivity and robustness are really key markers of the ways in which natural intelligent agents respond to problems. So for one more fun crow video, you can watch this crow trying to again get food from either a, a wide tube full of water or a narrow tube full of water. And it realizes after just dropping in two blocks that its original strategy of trying to get the food from the wide tube wasn't going to work. It had to switch strategies to then try to attempt to get the food from the narrower tube. And a big question is how we can take the best of these task and, task and motion planning methods, i.e. those hierarchical hybrid representations of actions and policies, but make them more adaptive and robust. So one way for robustness, which I won't talk about today, but I did want to flag, 
is to learn something like residual policies on top of a TAM planner in order to correct for real world physical perturbations. But another way for adaptivity and robustness would be to try to learn these hybrid action modes based on experience. That would ensure that they reflect the physical world in which they are used, as well as only representing the kinds of tasks the agent actually needs to accomplish within its environment. So we've been working on three different directions to this problem, two of which I don't have time to talk about today, but I would be happy to chat about later in collaboration with another student at MIT, and one of which I'll show you next. So we developed a very general technique that we call infinite mixture prototypes, which we originally used to discover task-specific mixed discrete and continuous structure for the problem of originally few shot classification by combining Bayesian non-parametric statistics with representation learning. Infinite mixture prototypes combine two key ideas, deep representation learning and infinite mixture modeling for inferring variable numbers of clusters within a continuous feature space. Critically, this lets us learn a deep embedding jointly with a non-parametric clustering process such that the embedding learns to be useful for the task of clustering-based classification. And unlike previous approaches to this problem, uh, infinite mixture modeling allows us to naturally adapt between either very simple representations of tasks like prototypes or complex representations like nearest neighbors by discovering this multimodal class structure that best supports the task loss. And in this first case, that's going to be classification. And in the next case, it will be regression. So importantly here, the model is discovering for itself how to cluster data in a way that allows it to do well at a task. And it has no limit on the number of clusters it can discover. This lets us do a really good job of discovering subcategory structure like characters from supercategory training like alphabets or superclasses. And in fact, when training only on supercategory labels, we can generalize to subcategories just as well as if we had that subcategory information during training. This is in really stark contrast to methods that don't learn this hybrid multimodal structure of classes like prototypical networks and therefore do a terrible job at learning from highly diverse data like alphabets. And these results similarly generalize to ImageNet, various super categories and subcategories. So that's, that's also very nice. We're hoping to now try to use them in real perceptual applications. But how might we use this approach to learn task structure for dynamics modeling or for planning? So just like in the first part of the talk, let's consider a tower of blocks that we can slide along a table or pick up. We might like to learn that we have two kinds of actions we can do, i.e. picking up blocks or sliding them along the table, as well as a deep dynamics model to predict how these affect the states of the blocks. If this seems familiar, that's great. It's just like this classification domain I just showed you, but now we're going to use a different loss function of regression and potentially something new to cluster. So specifically, we'll represent the tower here as a graph with an added gripper node to represent the robot's interaction with the tower. The updated vertices will now represent the next state predictions for the blocks in the tower, which all depend on EG prime, the deep edge representation of the gripper. We'll cluster this EG prime to discover different modes of gripper interactions with the blocks, with the task loss again being next state prediction instead of classification. We've applied this to two domains, the first in which an agent can slide or pick up blocks in a 2D world, and the second in which the agent can make stable or unstable pushes of a block tower in a 3D environment. In both cases, infinite mixture prototypes successfully discover the correct number of action modes, and this leads to both better overall dynamics prediction as well as planning performance with respect to methods that don't discover and use these modes from experience. So as we continue to work on this, we're thinking of how to apply infinite mixture prototypes to some of the most, what I think are exciting benchmarks being developed for meta learning and few shot learning for metadata set, a few shot learning benchmark that includes multiple different data sets to more comprehensively assess meta learning methods. We're looking at hierarchical extensions to infinite mixture modeling to model data sets as well as classes. For the tools game, we're applying infinite mixture prototypes to learn object-oriented physical strategy concepts like catapulting or support that will hopefully generalize to new objects and new scenes more effectively, as well as allow for improved action sampling. And for Meta World, a benchmark for skill learning, we're working on extending contextual reinforcement learning by meta learning discrete mixtures of context variables that will hopefully improve sample efficiency. So moving towards more general flexible AI, 
I think will require further improvements to both our benchmarks of intelligence as well as our models for addressing these benchmarks. So, so today I showed you examples of each kind of thing. To make more general and flexible agents, we developed deep relational policies with graph networks to tackle a new construction inspired task. To better test the problem solving and sample efficiency of humans and machines, we developed a cognitively inspired tool use benchmark and demonstrated that an agent imbued with a noisy physical simulator and object oriented policy could solve these tasks in a human like way. With the aim of building more capable tool using robots, we developed a planning method that can take advantage of physical knowledge in the form of hybrid symbols to solve long horizon dynamic tasks. And finally, with an eye towards models that can discover structure from experience, we combined infinite mixture modeling with meta learning to improve compositional generalization in the settings of classification and dynamics modeling. So going forwards in one final video, there's still much work to be done in reaching the capabilities of agents like this one, who cleverly repurposes a locket to escape the uh, quarantine of her baby room, a terrifying sight, I'm sure, for anyone who might have interacted with small children over the, the past few months. And to move towards agents with these impressive escape artist skills, we're working on several ongoing projects. So first, we'd like to make our tool using agents as adaptive and robust as this child by meta learning refinements of physics, modes, and policies with respect to specific tasks we'd like our agent to accomplish. Second, we're working to discover hybrid action modes like pull open the gate with the object and force such that they can be reused for new tasks like pulling with more force or using an unusual object like a locket instead of a hand to open the gate. And third, we want to relax our supervision for physical models such that we don't need to know the exact dynamics of chains in order to construct a plan that still uses a chain in an interesting way. And accomplishing these goals will require making use of task general structure like objects, physics, and modes, but in adapting it to task specific requirements like getting an out of reach object or escaping quarantine. And I believe that meta learning hybrid models provides a potential framework for such adaptation, wherein we might transfer these discrete task general structures, but learn the continuous task specific components such that we can condense very rich world knowledge to actionable plans in the moment. So thanks to my wonderful collaborators, which include a mixture of cognitive scientists, machine learners, and roboticists, as well as my funding source. And of course, all of you at the GRASP lab, especially the student organizers who are doing such a wonderful job for inviting me to speak to you today. If you're interested in any of the particular domains I mentioned, here are some links to check out and happy to answer questions. Thanks so much for a, a great talk, Kelsey. We are, we're joined by Rebecca Lee, Carl Schmeck Pepper, and Edward Hu, who are all PhD students in the GRASP lab. And they'll be moderating the Q&A portion uh, as we go forward. If you are participation in the, participant in the audience, please feel free uh, to use the Q&A interface to submit questions to be asked as well. So I'll hand it over to you guys. Uh, whoever wants to get started can jump out there. Um, I guess I can go first. Um, so first of all, a great talk. And uh, my you. question is, so in the tool game you highlighted, um, something mm -hmm. that I noticed is you can just point and click for each uh, tool. That, so there's like a unified um, action space, right, for each tool. Yes. But in the real world, like uh, how I use a scissor is very different than how I like, you know, use a shovel, right? I would mm -hmm. argue that these action spaces are very different. So have you thought about like any way on how to handle the like wide variety of tools in real life? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And definitely this the tools game is a simplification along many, many dimensions from real world to use tool use. But I think that's a very interesting one. Um, so I do have some thoughts about that. And certainly, you know, the robotics and learning um, communities have been thinking about affordances for a very long time, which are, I think, a very natural connection to action spaces for different kinds of tools. And I think that some of what I've been trying to get at most recently, where I talked about these infinite mixture modeling kinds of approaches for learning action spaces, I think might naturally lend itself to what you're talking about. So for example, you might wanna learn that you use scissors and a shovel differently, but you might at least hold a shovel and a broom very similarly in terms of like a high level kind of structured affordance for how you might start tackling that problem. Now you might use a different kind of specific trajectory of those to try to solve different kinds of particular tasks. 
but it might be worth clustering those tools in some kind of abstract affordance space. And so we've started thinking about that just a little bit um, in this sort of last space of projects I mentioned, but I'm very interested to explore that more in the future. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I have a question. So um, I wanted to ask like how, when you're like generating these scenes, obviously if you have like a bunch of different objects, then like those naturally form a graph, right? But if I have um, like envisioning like kind of moving forward and like, you know, maybe you don't actually know what's gonna be in your scene in the beforehand, or maybe something that, you know, is part of the wall, but actually this painting, I could just take it off and that could be an object now. Um, like how do you envision like kind of deriving those graphs on the fly? Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, so one thing that we've been exploring recently is making, and I think there's a group at UCSD who has recently done this successfully for 2D worlds. But one thing that you can imagine doing is essentially trying to learn in an end-to-end -end fashion, some representation of objects that are like bounding boxes, right? So the entire, like Vision has done a great job trying to do segmentation and object detection, um, but they haven't necessarily put those into then a graph-based model to try to model the dynamics of how that unfolds across time. So we've done a little bit of that even for just our 2D games where we're trying to both jointly learn an object detection pipeline as well as then assume that there's a graph that connects them that will predict the next frame. I think another very promising direction forwards and probably someone has done this in the few months since the NERF models have been out now, but you could also imagine attaching NERF to um, a scene and then essentially trying to pull out a latent graph structure from that representation that you again model dynamics on that then decodes a new nerf object for the next scene. Um, so I think that could be another cool direction and I haven't explored that but I imagine people somewhere are exploring it. Yeah. Um... I have a question, I guess. Um, so most of the work with uh, the tool game seems to be having the agent um, explore its own opportunities. So the agent takes action, sees what happens. Um, have you looked into at all what happens if you have some demonstrations of an optimal agent in either different environments or in the same environment, and if that speeds up its ability to learn how to solve these tasks. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's exactly what I've been doing recently. So we've, we've set up um, these problems where we essentially have some demonstration in a related level, but one that is not mm -hmm. identical. So like, for example, I showed a catapulting level and then at the end I showed a catapult level that we actually can't solve very effectively, which is this one that has a sub goal kind of catapult. And there, mm -hmm. the model is a, a variation of the model that we've been working on that uses more relational structure, is able to essentially take an observation of a catapulting strategy in that first type of scene, as well as humans, and generalize it to the other kind of scene. Um, and so that I think is, you know, a very exciting, at least initial step in that direction. Although, yeah, much work, much work to do in that space. Yeah, definitely. I guess Great. I have another question. Um, Go for it. Uh, so, um, have you exper have you experimented at all with using like um, like recurrent graph neural networks or something in order to, you know, do a, do stuff with hidden state? Yeah. So we've we've done a lot of that stuff in the gluing task that I mentioned. So actually, all of the graph networks I presented were recurrent ones with hidden states, um, but I did not get into the details there. But for the virtual tools environment, we haven't found that that has helped very much. So we spent a long time actually trying to use graph networks to both learn physical dynamics there as well as trying to learn policies. But we found that it really couldn't do it fast enough to like rival humans in that task. Even if we trained it on like very related kinds of background levels, like we have a uh, this workshop paper on the ogre or object-based generalization environment with um, this Facebook team and there, like, we tried training agents on essentially all of their fire levels, like 25 levels, and just generalize it to the virtual tools, some converted virtual tools levels. And graph networks also can't seem to handle that task. 
So we have in the gluing case, but we haven't been able to see it working yet in the tool using cases. Um, we also have a question from the audience uh, from Max Mintz. Um, how will non-rigidity, friction, and randomness, and dimensions and shapes play out here? Um, in which which kind of thing? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Max, could we have some more uh, specifications? Um, hmm. Okay, well, I can say like the, for, I th if I understood correctly, it's a question about the uncertainty. Okay, how will non-rigidity, friction and randomness and dimensions and shapes play out here? Yeah, so yeah. non-rigidity I think is a really fascinating case for tool use that is pretty underexplored. And I don't, I don't know for that particular question. For friction and the randomness in shapes, um, again, like the friction that we've considered is mostly constant, at least in these 2D kinds of games. So I don't think that would be particularly relevant, but the shapes, trying to predict how the shapes themselves resolve, like, like in that hook example, where a hook has to rotate around a platform, has been really challenging for us to to learn. Um, so, yeah, very challenging. I'm hearing some kind of like. Is that only on my end? Hello, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, you can still hear okay. me. Uh, yeah. Oh, very weird. All right. I think someone was trying to call me and it was coming through my, my Zoom. So sorry about that. Um, all of those things, though, that you pointed out are issues for all of the robotic stuff that I presented. Like, it really doesn't handle um, any uncertainty in any physical dimensions well at all. And so that was a big motivating factor for why we were trying to move to learning these kinds of modes. I don't know if that answers the question, but if you want to clarify it, I'm happy to try to answer again. I, I maybe I have a related question. We can get back to, to Max if he posts an update. Um, so, you know, you, you've done this work on being able to understand the modes in, in tool use, as I understand that primary application. Um, but, you know, also, of course, there's a lot of multimodality in the, you know, the dynamics of the world itself, even when an agent is not interacting with it. And even still, when you've already structured the world uh, in this graphical way between objects. So just for an example, pick two, a pair of two objects that could be not touching each other, be stuck to each other, or be sliding against each other. Have you thought about um, modeling multimodality at, at that level, and do you think that that is important for tool use? Yes, definitely. So that was sort of what we were trying to capture with um, this kind of work on the stable and unstable pushes. So that is actionable, but it's essentially like even if the even if the um, agent was not causing that action, if somehow something else was moving through the world in that way. There's this like multimodality in the dynamics that really matters a lot, which is whether or not this tower of blocks will be stable or it will fall down. Um, and one of the other motivations for a lot of this was thinking about particularly like multimodality in our tools environment, where if something is falling and it's falling on a point, then it can fall either left or right. Um, mm -hmm. And that ends up, you know, being clearly very different kinds of trajectories and what will happen. And so I, I would hope that the same kind of approach that we've been developing for these cases of like the stable, unstable towers would also apply to those kinds of just dynamics in terms of things like how shape will affect the outcome of things, or as you say, like sliding together or just in contact mm -hmm. and stable or pushing against each other. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you have a, maybe even just a, a qualitative uh, understanding of you know, how the difficulty of discovering modes sort of, you know, scales with the like number of true modes in the system? At the moment, we've only looked at two, like cases where there are two modes. Um, so mm -hmm. 
I do not yet have a sense of that. Although my guess is that it's not so much about the number of different modes so much as it is about how different those modes are, right? Mm -hmm. So like if this thing is very good at, in the case of the classification domain, the alphabets that it was trying to segment had at least 26 modes. And it was like, great, I can mm -hmm, find 26 yeah. modes. Um, but that's because each of those individual modes was very well separated. And so like to the extent that the modes are well separated in terms of the dynamics, I think this will have a, a relatively easy time capturing that. But if you have modes that are much more subtly similar in their dynamics, then that's going to become much harder to deal with. Great. Um, Rebecca, Ed, and Carl, any other questions from you guys? No, great talk. Thank you very much for, again, having me. This was very fun and very smooth. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming out, Kelsey. This was our this was our last uh, SFI seminar of the of the semester. So, uh, to our remaining audience members out there who stuck with us for the whole Q and A, uh, we'll be back to you next semester. And thanks everyone for coming out. Bye everyone. Yeah, thank you.